At the same time, Islam claims to possess the true and unadulterated interpretation of these scriptures. For the same reason, but the other way around, the older religion finds it much more <coughs> difficult to relate itself to its younger sister that pretends to have fulfilled its mission. If Christians think that Christ is God's final and unsurpassable revelation, in the same manner as Muslims think that the Quran is God's final and unsurpassable revelation, they have great difficulty to recognize Muhammad as God's prophet and messenger, because that would jeopardize their confession of Christ as God's final word. This genetic relationship makes it understandable, though not excusable, that Christians have given such a distorted picture of Islam and Prophet Muhammad in history. The third and central point, dialogue is a must. After having mentioned these difficulties, Fethullah Gulen <coughs> comes to the core point of his message. I quote, interfaith dialogue is a must today, and the first step in establishing it is forgetting the past, ignoring polemical arguments, and giving pre precedence to common points which far outnumber polemical ones. End of quotation. At this point, Gulen does not explain his rather categorical <coughs> statement that dialogue is necessary today. But later he will insist that an attitude of dialogue is not only required by modernity, but also by the very source of Islam. Gulen proceeds to indicate the method of dialogue, forgetting the arguments of the past and concentrating on common points. As a Christian theologian, I notice a convergence between the attitude of Fethullah Gulen and the attitude prescribed by the Second Vatican Council, which says the following. Over the centuries, many quarrels and dissensions have arisen between Christians and Muslims. The Sacred Council now pleads with all to forget the past and urges that a sincere effort be made to achieve mutual understanding for the benefit of all let them together preserve and promote peace, liberty, social justice, and moral values. Although Fethullah Gulen and the Second Vatican Council agree on this point, I have a, some problems with it, because I think that such appeals to ignore differences may run the risk of narrowing interreligious dialogue down to a form of polite conversation that is not very helpful when religious violence determines the larger context of this dialogue. Focusing on common points may be an important strategy when mutual suspicions are still prevalent, but if dialogue is to change the mentality of the parties involved, a reconciliation of memories has to take place. The fourth point, spiritual heritage of Abraham. In the next sentence of his text on the necessity of dialogue, Gurren refers to Abraham by quoting Louis Massignon, a French Islamicist and Christian scholar who referred to Islam, Islam as, I quote, the faith of Abraham revived with Muhammad, end of quotation. In this sense, by reawakening the faith of Abraham, Islam can have a positive prophetic mission in the post-Christian world. Though Gulen does not mention it, it is interesting to notice the fact that the Second Vatican Council seems to endorse Massignon's plea for acknowledging Abraham as common father for Jews, Christians, and Muslims. I skipped the quotation here because you can read it, of course, in the full text, and go on now to the fifth point. Um, towards the end of his argument that Christians agree to give Islam a specific, spe special prophetic mission in this time of secularization, Gulen mentioned an interesting statement by the late Pope John Paul II, who mentioned Muslim prayer as an example for Christians. It is true that the previous Pope has expressed this opinion many times, not only with reference to prayer, but also with reference to the fasting of Ramadan. Gulen states that Christianity and Islam can learn from each other. The West has its technological and scientific supremacy, while Islam is supreme in its religious fervor. It is certainly true that Islam, precisely as religion of submissiveness to God, may be an incitement for Western people to remember their religious roots. In Dutch public debates, Islam already has this function, albeit in a negative vein. But in such a view, 
the West is identified with the secular world over against Islam as a religious power. I think that it may be possible to do more justice to the power of Christianity as a religious presence in the Western world on the basis of the very same idea of mutual exemplarity or, as I would prefer to call it, spiritual emulation. This idea may be particularly fruitful between Abrahamic religions. I quote from the Quran, If God had so willed, he would have made you one community, but he wanted to test you through that which he has given you, so raise to do good, it's in Surah Al-Ma'idah. A Christian reading of this text may connect it with St. Paul's idea about a salvific jealousy between Jews and Gentiles to become acquainted with God's mercy in Christ. This shows the relevance of differences between religions as a means to mutual excitement, incitement. For this to succeed, it is necessary that the other religion be acknowledged as a religion and not as a political system only. It is at this point that people from the West often go wrong in their approach to Islam, as Gulen remarks toward the end of this section. They see Islam as political force, an ideology or a terror threat. In this context, an explicitly Christian approach to Islam may be of help. Final point, very shortly, mutual enrichment. Gulen stresses that the Quran accepts former prophets and their books. Therefore, Muslims should not enjoy defeating others in discussing matters of faith. He explains the important Quranic reminder to argue only in the best way with the people of the book. While I agree with Gulen that the discussion is often negative, I am convinced that the rules for debate formulated in the Quran and in subsequent Muslim tradition may be meaningful in determining the agenda of modern interreligious dialogue to help us towards mutual respect. Thank you.